Cardiff in Wales, where Doctor Who and Torchwood are made. This is a film about Edward Thomas, production designer on Doctor Who and Torchwood. He makes monsters. He's the man responsible for polishing up the TARDIS and giving the Daleks a bit of a facelift. And really that's the job of the production designer is to try and make sure all the elements come together for the final imagery. Keeps going unflappable on top of everything, always knows everything that's going on. It's quite brilliant. Day one, sealed one, and the prop is wrong. Can only go downhill from here. He's having a laugh, isn't he? The TARDIS on a London rooftop at Christmas, which we'll probably be shooting in July. <laughs> I love Russell T. Davis. What's that coming over the hill? Is it a monster? A lot of us have got a lot madder and a lot fatter and a lot older, and um, he's the same old Ed. This is a journey inside his mind. Yes, his mind. And then came out to a strange alien world from the mind of Edward Thomas. I'm enjoying it, absolutely enjoying it, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a dream job. Welcome to the weird and wonderful world of Edward Thomas. It is the hottest day of the year, but Christmas has come early in Cardiff. Work has started on the Christmas episode of Doctor Who six months before it actually appears on our screens. Edward Thomas is the production designer on Doctor Who and Torchwood. He's captain of the TARDIS and lord of the hub. He leads a hand-picked team of around 40 people dedicated to creating an amazing world of spaceships and aliens. In the past, Swansea boy Ed had hair. After working on feature films in South Africa for years, he returned to Wales to fulfill his childhood fantasy of working on Doctor Who. Superb, look at that, hot off the press. Look at that. And it was all going so well. And this is where it all begins. The Christmas script from his friend and collaborator, Russell T. Davis. We'll take these scripts and then I'll work through it and I'll highlight all the props, the set dressing, stunts, special effects, put it all into a budget, allocate people to jobs and start chopping because it's, it's always far too expensive because obviously the writers write the best possible story and then uh, it's our job then to try and curtail it a bit. I'm not there to write to budget really. It's like it's also my job to push things and, and I'm writing stuff at the moment for episode three of series three and actually I'm sitting there going, I can't see how we're going to do this. But that's actually a good process, is to, I shouldn't solve all the problems sitting at home. You've actually got Ed and a table full of people to hand it over to and say, how the hell are we going to do this? <laughs> I love Russell T. Davis. I just wish he'd stop writing such ridiculously complicated scripts. There's some big sets in here. There's, there's an awful lot of CGI elements. There's a lot of model-making elements. Big, but it has to be big, because it's Christmas Day. Doctor Who has always had its fair share of scary monsters and strange aliens. In my days, we were happy with some bubble wrap. I was a very good doctor. People used to tell me that they used to say, you were a marvellous doctor, Mr. Pertwee. Oh, and we also had some green paint. These days, it's very different. Modern viewers expect special effects to rival Hollywood. This can be a real challenge for the design team. Oh, God. A 15-foot spider. I hate spiders. I love them. Ed and his colleagues must now design and create the giant spider. He's read the script, and now he's off home to sketch. See you later. He's forgotten his shoes. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. I'm a nude. <laughs> the next day, it's all systems go in the art department. Torchwood, Shakespeare land. And then these are the dressing guys. Triss, Sean, and through to the, uh, the concept boys. So this is where the real work happens. Hello, ladies. These are the concept artists. 
some of the people who make Russell's dreams come true. As production designer, Ed needs to make sure his team are designing exactly what he needs. The spider is part of one massive scene. It's vital to get every bit right. Oh yeah, great. Concept guys have amazing imaginations, you know. They're incredibly talented artists. We'll sit down and come up with images just to start the ball rolling, and then finally things get sculpted up. We look at the sculpt, change the sculpt. Everybody has an input. It's just the best job that you could hope for, really. And it's a job that, I, you know, I, I dreamed of having when I was a kid, so... Drawing pictures relating to Doctor Who was what I did when I was little, so... To end up doing it and getting paid for it is not bad. The team get their heads down straight away. Drawing, making models, sketching. Elsewhere, prosthetic experts, computer image gurus, experienced model makers all beavering away. It's a very complex scene and the team has no time to waste. So the plan going forward is, Mark knows the sizes now, does he? Yeah. I first met Ed when he came in for an interview, and we were interested in a Swansea boy, obviously, but he was brilliant the moment he walked through the door. I always loved him because the first, one of the very first things he started talking about was health and safety, which is quite unusual for a designer to launch straight into that. And first of all, I thought, well, that's good, because health and safety is important. But at the same time, I sort of thought that was like the first indication of the scale he was thinking on. You saw anyone, when a designer starts talking health and safety, you think, oh, well, they're not just talking three-walled set, are they? They're thinking big and they're thinking really spectacular stuff. So that was the first indication of anything. Oh, yeah, he's got his eye on the right scale. Compared to the way he started out when we first started Doctor Who, where he had a tiny little office, now he's got an empire and he's the same bloke. He keeps going, unflappable, on top of everything, always knows everything that's going on. It's quite brilliant. You sure? Every day Ed sits down to watch the previous day's rushes. It's his quality control and the only way he can keep an eye on his empire. He is a man possessed, an angel possessed by demons, and today he's angry. Day one, scene one, and prop is wrong. Yeah. Can only go downhill from here. Ed spotted a mistake. The doctor is using a silver fire extinguisher instead of a red one. A silver fire extinguisher? In the TARDIS? Outrageous. Whatever next. We've taken all the stickers off it, and it's silver. We've established gold fire extinguishers in the in the TARDIS up until now. So even if it was anything but red, which was the one that we asked for, it should have been gold. Something as small as that could, it could have a knock-on effect, you know, I mean, that was, it was a visual thing, really, you know. We'd requested a red fire extinguisher, and the fire extinguisher that turned up was a silver fire extinguisher. There's no room for that sort of mistake. Silver, silver. which is a totally alien colour to the TARDIS, there is no silver in the TARDIS. Well, you know, there's little bits, but it's not predominant colour. So, it, which means that it doesn't fit in with the architecture, which means that it's not Gallifreyan, which means that it's, it could be just bought corner shop, which is fine as well, but it's not, not what we're trying to achieve. None of it's life-threatening, obviously, but it's important, you know. At the end of the day, you know, you want to produce the best product you possibly can. There are certain rules and guidelines, and some of those are colour, some of those are architecture, and you've got to stick to them, otherwise the, the programme will not hold together. Visually, it will start to look cheap. There's something you don't see in your average spaceship. It's the first day's filming for the Christmas episode, and there's a frantic rush in one of the studios. The TARDIS was recently relocated and didn't travel too well. This is the first time it's been filmed in its new home. But before the crew arrive, it needs dressing with wires and pipes. The coral column needs a lick of paint. The console lights need to be brighter. Ah, yes, the console. <laughs> I remember it well. I don't remember it being that organic in my day. Three quarters of an hour till D-Day. Three quarters of an hour. That looks a bit bright there, doesn't it? Have you a bit of a drip on it? Because we do see that a lot, don't we? We just had a bit of breakdown on there. Yeah, it's good. It's looking, it's looking better than it was. <laughs> so there. 
full MOT in a service. I hope, anyway. We haven't tried starting it up yet, but give it a go. A call is put through to one of the crew in the hope that the doctor might be late. But he's not. Heavens to Betsy. But the crew are on their way. Ed's team have only minutes to finish everything before David Tennant gets here. Yes, David Tennant. It makes me shiver just to say it. But surely they can do it. They're time travel experts after all. They've made it, thank goodness. Miraculously, when the doctor arrives, everything's ready. Hopefully, he won't get wet paint on his lovely scarf. Uh, what? What do you mean, he doesn't have a scarf? A doctor without a scarf? Nonsense. A new dawn, and the big bosses Julie Gardner and Russell T. Davis have called to see Ed and to talk about Torchwood. It feels very different. Torchwood, it's, it's the antithesis of Doctor Who. It's nine o'clock. It's a team of characters rather than a two-hander. We don't travel the universe. It's absolutely UK 2006 set. Uh, so they're very, very different. In terms of the schedule and the feel of them, they're very different because Torchwood is a heavily night-based series. Which <laughs> is obviously brilliant in the middle of the summer when there's not much night. Torchwood is set in Cardiff Bay, and its main characters live a mile underground, below the water tower. It's a spooky drama, and it's for adults of all ages. Spooky. In story terms, we're four stories below Millennium Square, directly below the, the, the sculpture, the chrome sculpture that's there, which in our storyline fits over our our sculpture as a sleeve. So we've got the ability to replicate the water. We've built a reservoir at the top of our tower so that we can have sort of a, as, if, as if the main tower leaks down onto ours. This is one of the, the many standing sets that we've got. And this is like the precinct, if you like. This is the, what they call a precinct set. This is where a lot of the show gets made. A lot of our characters spend a lot of time here. Captain Jack actually lives here. It's a big number. When we started conceptualising it with Russell, just conversations and sketches, and we started the build, the actual steelwork structure, it took about five weeks to build. And then we shipped that in, put it together. And, you know, I think it's, uh, I think it's done exactly what it, what, what it, what it required. What is Torchwood? Who are you? What is this place? <laughs> Even though he has two permanent sets at his disposal, Ed and the crew still cruise Cardiff, hunting for new locations in their quest for sci-fi perfection. It might be the middle of summer, but Ed's mind is only on Christmas. He's convinced he's found the perfect location, but nobody's listening. What's the matter with everyone today? Must be nerves. Well, maybe it's the heat. It does look good. The perspective is a you know, a lovely place. Well, I mean, if you go and stand close to it, you know, and look up, you know, this is amazing. Ah, right. It's our first tortured Doctor Who standoff. This is where I'm supposed to split myself in half, you see, and be on two reckeys at the same time. But, uh... Better go say hello. He's bumped into Julian Luxton. Yes, that Julian touch. Luxton, his Torchwood designer, in the middle of Cardiff. Yeah. Ah. That first Doctor Who Torchwood stand-up. <laughs> you all right? Yeah, good. Going OK? Yes, yeah, going. Is he he's running a bit late at the moment, James. Oh, is he? So we've done our first recce without him. Is he sticking to the budget? Uh, yes. Page one, Arch. Page one. Page one. All been well. And yourselves? We're doing all right. We've just been to church just to pray. Really? We've just been to pray, so now yes. the prayers are over. Yes. We'll, carry on with, yeah, we'll carry on with the recce now. Okay, we're going to go into a nightclub now, All right, in then. a dingy hole. See, that's we'll the difference. That's the difference between Doctor Who and Torchwood, you see. We're a family show, <laughs> and we do churches. And we're going to a nightclub. Sin below. Yeah, I love it. See you later. A production meeting is held to discuss the Christmas episode in minute detail. They usually go on for hours. It's a very big day for any boy. It's going to be quite difficult to contain her within a green screen. Maybe, maybe even 20 by 20 is not going to be big enough. It's a tense moment. His neck is on the line if they don't like the spider. 
time to reveal the model to the whole production team. It's a hit. Spider is such a complicated villain, if you like him. Physically, it's, it's such a complicated machine because of the scale of it, because of how it's powered. All those things have to be thought through. When you create the platform for the spider, how does that tie in with what's around it that exists in the location? So there's a lot of planning elements, and, and really that's the job of the production designers, to try and imagine and, and read when we first read the script, and what we see when we first read the script is carried right through, and that all those elements as they come into play all work together. The prosthetics team retreat to start work on the full-size version, 15 foot long, a BBC spider. It'll be a massive job to build in time. Today, Ed and his team are out in Cardiff with director Eros Lin and his crew. They found the location for a big Christmas scene where the doctor cleverly uses a cash machine. This is the location for the sequence where we've got Donna and the doctor uh, running, up the, running up the street as fast as they can go. We've got a steady cam that's going to be um, sprinting along with them, travelling with them. He then continues um, to the cash machine and the money flies up into the air, filling this whole area with cash fluttering in the air. Um, and he starts to sprint after her, um, stopping the Santas from shooting him with a... My role is really is when we come on the recce, I explain what I'd like to see and work with the director. We, we work out what we, where we're going to be shooting. And then it's a question of then overseeing that everything that we've talked with the director gets positioned on the day. The street they're in seems ideal, except it doesn't have an all-important cash point. That means another job for Eddie's boys. The plan is here to invent this cash point machine, which we're going to put into this doorway. Our construction manager is going to replicate one of these pillars and build it in so that we can get the cash point machine in there and, and it gives any effects enough room behind through the doors to, uh, to put their woofers, their machines that will spit the money out. It's all going very well. Back at the studio, Ed's team is busy on a very unusual job, designing Doctor Who money, or should that be Time Lord tenors? <laughs> Let's have a look, Arch. This is what we've been reduced to, producing our own money. When you, when you run out of real money, you produce your own Doctor Who. It'll be amazing, though, because It'll these... Be more than yeah. Than. They'll be on... The day after we shoot, these will be on eBay. When we were shooting in the first series, they were selling handfuls of paper snow on eBay for after one of the shoots we did in Swansea, weren't they? The special effects team have one quick practice to check the machine works and that the money flies out properly. Oh dear. That's not the money shot they were after. It's filming day. An enthusiastic crowd has gathered to watch Christmas in July. David Tennant and Catherine Tate have arrived on location. Look, there they are. Oh, to be young and beautiful. The fake bank is fully loaded with who notes, and the Christmas decorations are up. It's time for them to battle an evil Santa Claus or two and use that special cash point. We're doing a scene which is Christmas Eve, uh, supposedly in London. So we've dressed the street behind me as a street in London. We've added a cash point machine and a, a telephone box. Um, and a load of Christmas decorations in all the shop windows, there's Christmas lights and bits and pieces, and we've got quite a big extras day. Um, and, of course, with the popularity of Doctor Who now, what's happened is, is that when we, when we filmed here on the first and second series, you get very few crowds, but at the moment now, obviously, the word has spread about Doctor Who and that we're here, and uh, it's carnage. We've got the people just turning up to have a look. You know. It's good, we'll just keep them out of shot. Well, we've been here for two days, um, decorating the shop. We've been working closely with Howells, uh, which is one of the bigger shops here, and their, their, their window dressers have been out helping us, pulling down all their old Christmas decorations from up in the attic and, and dressing the shop. And then we've imported Christmas trees and snowmen and bits and pieces. So we've been here for about two days, just getting it all ready, making sunny Cardiff look like Christmas. In. Having his hair combed? Ha! <laughs> They'd never have dared comb mine. The crowd are getting excited as the actors start rehearsing, and so am I. The doctor practices using the sonic screwdriver on the cash machine to distract the evil Santas. Don't I'm getting married on Christmas Eve. Can't bear it, I like Christmas. The doctor has to save Donna. It's Christmas Eve, and she's late for her own wedding. What's up, Harry? I've not done this in years. What did you do? A hundred? Just, just call the ref. What did you do? Something 
Martian, now phone. I'll get money. Ed was really pleased. The money worked a treat. His crew now have to pick up every note before the spectators pocket them. But there's no rest for the wicked. Ed's next job is to find somewhere to film the biggest challenge of all, the spider scene. He's off to have a look at a place in Newport Docks with Eros Lynn. Yes, Eros. That's Welsh for golden boy. And he is. And this is it, a disused pumping station, which they hope will have the scale they need for their huge spider. <coughs> you walk into these places, you're looking for shape, architecture, things to be able to bounce light off, because um, you know what you're going to bring to it, you know that you're going you're to turn it around into something totally, completely different. The final scene on our screens will be made up of the real building, a scale model, and computer-generated images, but hopefully no one will know which bit is which. Just like the old Doctor Who episodes, really. <laughs> so, so the, the Doctor's where you're standing there, and if we... Put her up on something. If we lifted her up on something so that she'd be higher than us, then we could shoot into that corner there. You know, we'd get quite a bit of height before we hit that ceiling. I knew it had a lot of texture, a lot, it had a huge scale, and I knew it had the elements that we wanted. So really it was convincing the director that it would work. If the spider was at the bottom of those stairs, looking at us, and we, we, our edge of frame was the, the steps, yeah. and then came around to say this ladder, and that was our immediate <laughs> background. So the spider is roughly where Arwell is, but maybe forward slightly. I knew that the elements really were ideal to work for us. Armed to the teeth with paper, pencil and photos of the location, Ed's back at base telling his team how the different elements of a spider scene must fit into place. From now on, it's imperative that everything they draw and make is exactly to scale. Any errors will spell disaster. So what we're suggesting is the wall here is our wall looking out into the main chamber. This will become the spider's level up here. What we'll have is all these elements here reverse, so you'll have these huge vats in the background, and then you'll have these elements foreground, the doctor and Donna stand here, and they'll hopefully never cross that line, because obviously that wall doesn't exist. Confident that his men are fully briefed, Ed leaves them to their computers and model making. They've got little time to get it all done. The deadline is looming, the pressure is on. That's two boys, if we can have that done by six o'clock, we'll be laughing. Thank you, troops. This is it. The big day has finally arrived. The day they film the doctor battling against the evil spider. I wonder who'll win. It's really fantastic to see someone given something they deserve like this, and the size of the studio and the size of the enterprise now with all the shows running at once is absolutely what it deserves. My boys and girls are going to be extremely busy getting it already, so, uh, and they shoot until the early hours of the morning, so, uh, so we'll, we'll see how it goes. I'll tell you later on. He's an absolute joy to work with, a complete joy. I mean, he loves it. I mean, that's, that's the first thing above anything else I think you're looking for, is you want people to really believe in what you're doing. This old dump of a building has been transformed into an amazing spaceship. Well, that's the BBC for you. The actress Sarah Parrish arrives on set to try out her new costume. Ooh. The design process took months to complete, and now, Finally, it's time to see the end result. But will it all come together on the day? Um, has anyone got my key? <laughs> yeah. 
their ability to take something like that and realize it is amazing. You know, it's a huge feat of engineering. It's a massive steel structure involved, it's weighted at the back to the actress's weight, you know, so that she can move around. And the actress, you know, has, has animated herself to almost be as animatronic as the spider is, you know. So rather than her having different movements, she's, she's actually tied her movement into the limitations of the, of the spider's movement. But that just adds to it, you know, that just makes the whole thing feel horrific. Ragnos. That's impossible. You're one of the Ragnos. Empress of the Ragnos. You're the Empress. Where's the rest of the Ragnos? Or are you the only one? Such a sharp knife. That's it, the last of your kind. The Ragnos come from the dark times, billions of years ago. Billions, they were carnivores, omnivores. They devoured whole planets. Kill this chattering little doctor man. Don't you hurt him. No, no, don't you hurt him. No, I won't let him. At all. Ah, now, accept. Take aim. Well, I just want to point out the obvious. They won't hit the bride. They're such very good. So just, 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 just hold on, hold on, just a tick, just a tiny little, just a, a, a tick. If you think about it, the particles activated in Donna and drew her inside my spaceship. So reverse it. The spaceship comes to her. It was all a huge success. Edward Thomas and his team triumph again. I'm enjoying it. Absolutely enjoying it. You know, it's uh, it's uh, it's a dream job. Next morning, Ed is back on the Torchwood set. Just another beginning. That's life for Ed. The Christmas episode may be finished, but there's another series of Doctor Who to work on, and of course, Torchwood and the new children's drama Sarah Jane. Oh, lovely! Yes, that means more monsters. More Martians, more gadgets, more spaceships, more Slivine, giant snails, talking squids, screaming wokes. Oh. It's time to don the official 2W rose-tinted spectacles next for a look at Christmas past. <laughs>